God, just uh, decrease me, increase you, so the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Psalm 51, 1 through 4, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. And then verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud your deliverance. Amen. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. God's word for God's people, you may be seated. Since my son Nicholas has been out of college, he has been on his own. And I put quotations around that. He and I are always playing what I like to call the I owe you game. Mom, can I borrow a couple of hundred dollars? I owe you, Mom. You know I'll pay you back. Mom, $50. I've just got to make this rent. I didn't get enough money. Can I? I'll pay you back. And it's just amazing to me because Nicholas has no idea the cost of life. He's just doing it, you know, step by step. And then in the midst of all this, Nick will say to me sometimes when he comes here, Mama, I want to take you out to dinner. I want to buy you a dinner. And I ha don't have the heart to tell him, baby, that's my money too. <laughs> Everything you're doing is my money. But I'm just, no, it's just this child, and I think a generation of children, and I mean no disrespect, but I think a generation of children have, are blissfully unaware of how much in debt they already are to their parents. You know, college and clothing and insurance and phone bills and a couple of hundred here and five dollars there. And at 25, I'm not sure that Nicholas or any other young person his age has reached the level of maturity necessary to understand the process of parenting. That it is an expensive and costly endeavor. A hallmark of immaturity is ignorance concerning the real costs of physical life. Well, there is a spiritual corollary to this truth. We have to mature spiritually to better understand what our salvation costs Jesus. We have to mature spiritually. Now the psalmist wrote, my mouth will tell of your righteousness of your salvation all day long, though I know not its measure. So ultimately, we will never know the full measure of the cost. We know that Jesus died for us on the cross, but we'll never understand what that sacrifice meant. The Bible tells us about the physical suffering. Several years ago, we saw the movie that Mel Gibson put out called The Passion. 
and we understood the, the blood and we got to see close up the sweat and the beatings and the cursings and how Jesus was humiliated and, and nailed to a cross that was created for torture. But that still doesn't tell us what it meant for a perfect God to step into humanity, humbling himself even to death death on the cross. That, that doesn't explain it to us. It just tells us a bit. We'll never understand the full depth of salvation, but as we spiritually grow, we'll understand a little bit more about it. And as we spiritually grow, we'll understand that his salvation that God gives us freely is tied into the depth of our sinfulness. The depth of salvation is connected to the depth of our sinfulness. And the more you walk, the more you mature in this walk, the older you get, you begin to see sin and the results of sin all around you. That comes with spiritual maturity. I was driving to church the other Sunday. Uh, it, was, it was during the week, as a matter of fact, and a young boy was on a bicycle coming across over by Roxbury Community College going up the hill. And we were stopped at, for some reason, at an intersection at the stop sign. He was talking to some friends. He was on a bike. He was carrying a bike on his shoulder with one wheel missing. And I knew that this bike was stolen just about the way he was talking and kind of bragging to his friends. And, and, I, and I thought, this child has no idea that he's sinning. He's bragging about this theft, and I'm sure it was a theft, and he has no idea that this is sin and how this price has been paid for his freedom and he's still sinning. We, we, we grow and we begin to see sin everywhere and the results of sin everywhere, not just for that child, but for myself. As I grow older, I begin to understand. That's why this Lenten season is so important, you see. This 40 days of repentant reflection that we're in now, and this 40 days of prayer that Roxbury Presbyterian Church is involved in now, helps us to confront our sin. Because what we're asking you to do in this prayer period is take some time every day and pray to God. We have different uh, issues and different uh, subjects we want you to pray on, but the bigger part of that is confession. To confess God your sins, and that's what this Lenten season offers us the opportunity to do, to see our sins more clearly. We've discussed this difficulty that we all have with the notion of sin, you see. Sin has such a wide range of meanings to us. We refer to it as evil or mistakes or missing the mark. The Bible focuses on pride as a defining factor in sin, believing that we are our own God. So we need to make sure we take some time to think about sin. Because if you don't think about it, then you don't think it exists, you see. There's even a theological school that says sin is based on our low self-esteem. But that's a strong factor. But whatever the cause or the roots of it, we all know we're sinners, but we need to remind ourselves of that. Because you see, there are people walking around right now that don't know they're sinners and don't care. We have to take this Lenten opportunity to examine and confront that, looking at the ways how much do we owe God? Oh God, I just owe you so much because you're so good to me. Your grace is so sufficient. And in gratitude, I owe you some stuff. Not because I'm trying to buy my way to heaven, but because I love you, God. Because I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by your grace. Yes, yes. So I want to take a minute to just talk to you a minute about this notion of what we owe God. Because when you think about what you owe God, then you realize how much you've let God down. How much you let God down? We, 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 we've let God down much more than we admit. And that's the catch. We need to admit it every once in a while. So let's go to the text. Imagine this scene. Here Jesus is on the most important night of his life. Fully divine, fully human, about to undergo this suffering that we can't conceive, you see. Verse 37, he's accompanied by Peter, John, and James. Those are three of his closest companions. They were with him at the transfiguration. These are the, the men he depends on of all the disciples, the ones he calls to. They have an intimate relationship. There is trust between Jesus and these three. So here, here he 
is with his true friends there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is grieved and agitated, the text tells us. And that doesn't really do justice to the Greek phrase, which suggests wretchedness. He is really struggling because he knows what's to come. Jesus comes to his death exposing his human side, vulnerable, unguarded, unprotected. Now this is God who is, who, is fully, who is fully divine but fully human and decides to come to this, this moment as a human so that he can fully experience this horrible situation. And all he asks from his disciples is to pray. Pray with me. Come here. We're in the garden now. Let's, let's pray. And they're asleep. He says, stay awake with me. And they're gone. Now, in all fairness, these disciples weren't being lazy or indifferent. The Gospel of Luke says they were sleeping from their own despair and exhaustion. But they know, and Jesus knows, the crisis that's pending. And he wants them to pray with them so that they won't be tempted to deny them later, so that they won't, won't be tempted to the world's uh, call, so that they will stay on the path. All the different reasons that he calls them to pray with him, but he needs them to pray with him, and they fail. Think how you'd feel if you were one of those disciples, and Jesus wanted you just for that moment, and you failed him. Think how they must have felt in that garden that night. Once they realized what they had done, it produced even more despair on a despairing night. It produced even more grief in a grievous situation because Jesus is grieving, they're grieving, and now there's more agonizing grief. We all have experiences, real times of despair caused by real events in our lives. Death, failure, disappointment, divorce, Times when life hits you so hard, you don't think you can get back up again. We all suffer from that. Psychologists assure us that grieving these, these situations is quite normal. You're supposed to grieve them. It's necessary. It allows us to integrate loss into our lives. Sometimes we don't grieve when we're supposed to grieve. I remember when I was divorced. I didn't grieve because I had a son, I was breaking up a family, I had, I had all kinds of things I was trying to hold together, and I was just going to push, push through. And I didn't grieve at all through that process, and it took a long time, anybody who's gone through that. And then later, I had a dog, I bought a dog for Nick, the dog died, and I was grieving for years. And it took me a while to realize I wasn't just grieving for the dog, and I was grieving, grieving for the dog. I was grieving for that whole period in my life that I hadn't had time to grieve. The Bible tells us there is a time to grieve, that you have to mourn, that there is a time. Ancient religious practices, including Judaism, set aside a certain time for mourning. Seven days, if you're a Jew, you use that time to mourn. If you watch Middle Eastern funerals on, on television when somebody's been killed or somebody dies, they are weeping and wailing, and it's very emotional and it's very passionate. That is the time to mourn. This spiritual journey, like life, has a rhythm to it. That's what God built into it. And that's why Ecclesiastes says there's a time to build up, a time to break down, a time to weep, a time to dance, a time to mourn. I've often thought that one of the reasons that depression is so rampant in our community is because people don't know that they can mourn. Yeah. They grieve themselves. They grieve their loss. They don't know how. They don't know. And so they carry all this stuff. And then when you're mourning, what you try to do is medicate. You try to deaden that mourning. You don't want to feel it. And so then you're, you're always trying to, you know, deaden it out. So alcohol. And we're mourning something. We're mourning our childhood. We're mourning our father and lady. Whatever, we're all mourning. We're told to be strong and move on. We're told that we don't have faith if we mourn. We're told to get over it. But you have to take the time to mourn. You have to. It does not mean that we've lost faith. It does not mean that we are weak. When we feel sorrow over loss, it is time to mourn. Remember when Lazarus died and Jesus wept. Now, Jesus wept in perfect faith and assurance of the coming glory of Lazarus' resurrection. Jesus knew that he was going to raise up Lazarus, but he still wept. 
He wept because he loved Lazarus. He wept because he mourned with others. You see, sorrow can hold us together. And sorrow is always in God's economy. It's always followed by resurrection, you see. Now that's not the world's economy, but God's economy. Because God says, you may weep at night, but I promise you joy is coming in the morning. And so sorrow is part of the rhythm of God's economy. It's part of the rhythm of God's life. Even deep extreme anguish has a place and a time because a broken heart softens hardened edges. The world preaches that only the strong survive, but deep anguish softens our hearts and that's how God can penetrate them. Amen. God doesn't want to go into a hard heart. There's nothing there for God. God wants your heart soft. It helps us to respond to suffering in others. I know what you're going through because I've mourned too. Now mourning and, and grief is not about self-pity. I'm not talking about that. And there's a lot of that going on. I'm talking about mourning. Mourning a loss and knowing that God is going to show up. Grief over loss is necessary because there is always God's comfort and God's grace to be found in the midst of it. But the grieving that I want to pay attention to just for a few seconds this morning is the grieving that occurs when we let Jesus down, when we sin against Jesus. In fact, nearly every waking hour, most of us sin by thought, word, or deed against Jesus. So sometime we have to take out time in order to acknowledge that. I don't think you're supposed to walk around like that all the time, but I do believe you should give some time to grieving your letting Jesus down. Because even our best deeds can be stained with sin. Even our best deeds can be stained with impure motives. And if we don't remember it, we, we don't acknowledge it. Now that day that I saw that boy on that bicycle and I was all upset about his sin, the real issue there was that somebody stole my bike about three years ago. And I am still looking for that guy who stole my bike. I have no idea what I think I'm going to do, but I know that part of my problem is unforgiveness. I'm still carrying that grudge. So everybody, time I see somebody on a bike, I think, is that my bike? And then I you know, start judging that kid. Well, I know that unforgiveness is a sin, because God told me it was. You see, those of us who consider ourselves saints are just sinners who get up. We're all sinners. And we need to be aware that our sins are always before us. That's what the psalmist said. The sin I want to focus on today is a sin that the disciples sinned that night in the garden, because I think there was a sin going on there. Now the Bible doesn't say that, and I could find no commentary to say that, but here's my theory. These disciples were asleep when Jesus needed them. They were asleep. So does that mean they were, they were moaning because of him or his loss? Or does that mean they might have been crying or mourning because of their loss? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me that. All I know is that Jesus needed them. And for that little period in time, they let Jesus down. How often do we let Jesus down? How often in just kind of subtle ways that we don't even think about it. If we are not consistently expressing gratitude to God for his love, his grace, we are neglecting Jesus. We are letting Jesus down. If we are so concerned about our own issues that we don't reach out in some sacrificial way to our neighbor or a stranger, we are letting Jesus down. If we fall asleep when we should be awake to the glory of God, we are letting Jesus down. There are so many ways that we let Jesus down. We neglect Jesus in our day-to-day -day lives. We begin to get a better grip when we understand that of how much it costs for God to send Jesus to the cross. Some people say, well, Reverend Liz, little sins don't count. You know, there are, the Catholic Church has levels of sins, and most of us think there are acceptable sins and respectable sins and, and those that are not so respectable. But I'm not sure that I want to take the opportunity or the chance in deciding what's important and what's not important. Because the Bible says all sin is lawlessness. 
That's what the Bible says. So I'm not sure that's my job to decide your sin is better or less than my sin. All sin is serious because all sin is turning against God. When John says sin is lawlessness, he's not drawing distinctions. And the reason we need to think about it is because we say, oh, you know, it's a little, it doesn't bother if I gossip. That's all right. That doesn't hurt nobody. But it does hurt somebody. Because all of God's laws, when you think about it, it's so efficient. They're there in many ways to protect us from ourselves. When you really go back and look at God's laws and look at Jesus and what he was saying, we need to be aware that we're sinners. And then we can have this broken spirit and contrite heart. And you see, that's what God demands from us. That's what God requires. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. To bow down with awareness of our spiritual bankruptcy. To be crushed in our spirit with guilt. To be sorry, remorseful about our attitudes and actions. Not that we're going to lay there all time but that we are aware that we've made mistakes and we've fallen short of the kingdom of God. I've been uh, paying attention to Jesse Jackson Jr.'s uh, situation in Chicago and the thing that has touched me so much about that is that this young man has just stood up and said, now I don't know the background, I don't know, it doesn't matter to me, but he stood up and said, you know what, tell everybody in Chicago I know I let them down. He's remorseful, that's what I've noticed. Now he's guilty, obviously. He's no trial. He said, no trial. You're right, Your Honor. I did it. I'm... But that lets you know that there's potential for change. Right. See, when you're not remorseful, when you don't take the time to, 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 to really bow down before God and be contrite, then that means you're just going on business as usual. When you take a little time to say, God, I'm sorry, I messed up big time, that's a contrite heart. And that means there's room, you're allowing room for God to step in and change you. But you've got to give him, you gotta give him some, some honesty there. You've got to be transparent. Lord, create in me a clean heart, renew in me a right spirit. That's of all the scriptures, and there's so many. I think that's one you should memorize, because you can always call it up. Create in me a clean heart. This is not about the boy on the bicycle, Lord. This is about me. And then we don't rationalize or make excuses. We don't try to fool God. You can't fool God. We don't seek to blame circumstances on others. The story of the fall of Adam and Eve. Everybody was trying to blame somebody. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. The snake had no comment. But everybody was trying to say something. We all do it. We do it all the time. Well, Lord, if you were married to this jerk, you'd be cheating too. No, no, somebody said that. Somebody has. Or, it's not my fault. My boss is so cheap, I have to steal this print and paper. <laughs> I break into folks' apartments because my great-great-grandmother was a slave. I mean, we have all kinds of rationalizations. But God requires a broken and contrite heart to be honest with God, to be determined, because then you can turn around. You know, one of my biggest and long, longest lesson, lasting lessons from my own sense as a child, and I, and I, you know, we were in our pre-teen age. My brother and I, we were, some, we were some bad kids. We were preacher's kids. And we were, oh, we were tough, we were tough. We were hard, we were hard. And one time my parents had gone out, and we were probably, I'm gonna say, maybe 10, 11, whatever, in that range. And we were wrestling and fighting in the living room. My mother always told us, do not go into my living room. She knew, don't go in the living room. You're gonna be heathens, be heathens in the backyard. And so we went into the living room, we were just fighting and the dog, we had a little puppy, he was running around. And I pushed my brother or he pushed me or whatever. And he went through the front door, the pane glass. The front door. Because we were moving out, we were just roughhousing. By the grace of God, he was not hurt. But we knew we were in big trouble. First of all, we lived in a parsonage. And that, my daddy always told us every week, this is not our house. <laughs> So we had done something awful. Well, my mother and father came home, and we thought we could blame it on the dog. <laughs> okay, that was the best we could come up with. And my mother just looked at us like, are you, are you crazy? Do you really have your lost? But she punished us, I think, for about 10 years. But the worst punishment that day for me was my father sat down with my brother and me, and he said, I'm so disappointed in you. You've let me down. And I would rather take Five beatings. You know how your mama sent you for your own switch? That's, that's how I grew up. I 
would rather go out and get 12 switches and be beaten by every one of them than have my father sit there and look like he was about to cry and said, you're so, you've let me down. I'm so disappointed in you. But I'll never forget that moment. And I'm old now and still remember that moment. And that's why we need to be contrite and have broken spirits before God. Grieving before God can bring about all kinds of transformation. It brings a, a change in our attitude. It can bring repentance, obviously, because we promise we're not going to do it again. That was the last time I broke a pane glass window in my mama's house. Grieving welcomes the heart of God because God responds to this broken heartedness. And most importantly, grieving encourages a fresh start. And if you go back to the text, you can see that that is the blessing that's illustrated. The disciples have done an unthinkable thing. They've gone to sleep instead of watching for Jesus. So Jesus lets them sleep that third time. He goes back and prays, and then he comes back to them and he says, get up, let's get going. And so the message there is, is that if you take this time to grieve, if you take this time to mourn what you've done against God, God will call you out on it and say, let's get up and keep moving. I got you. I understand. You're forgiven. Now we move on. I got things for you to do. You grieve. You're inspired by God to move to the next thing. You see, because we want to serve God. We don't serve God out of perfection. We serve God out of transparency. And so, God, I'm sorry, and I grieve. And God says, let's get up and move on. Let us pray. Yeah.